Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. It is our 63rd deck and it's titled Ashling Used Explosion. It's super effective. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scribefall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So really quickly, before we get into the actual deck tech, I do want to take a second to highlight some of our social media accounts as well as ways that you can support this channel if that is something you are interested in doing. So first up, we do have our Twitter account, which is at 13POYNZ, Reddit, which is u slash POYNZ13, and our email, dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. You are, of course, always welcome to reach out to us on any of these platforms, and I am always happy to respond. I love hearing from the community and hearing what you guys think of some of the videos or maybe just answering questions that you may have. So always happy to get in contact with people. And then if you are looking to support our content a little bit more directly, you can head over to our TCG player affiliate link that is in the description of this video below. And any cards you purchase from TCG player after clicking on that link lets them know that we sent you there and we get a little bit of a kickback from them. So any cards you want to purchase, I would love it if you would use our link. We very much do appreciate that. And then finally, of course, we do have our Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us there, patreon.com slash Dungeon Learners Guide. We have a ton of unique content there for our patrons. You can support us at several different levels. You can get the deck lists a week early. You can get access to the full unedited gameplay videos if you want to see how some of the interactions between the players actually go. And then, of course... We do also have a Discord where you are able to jump in and try to join some games, kind of talk about building some decks, and in general just hang out with some great people. So I do highly recommend either of those things. And of course, I do have to thank our two patrons right now. We have William Swiftfoot and Dude Lumper. So thank you both very much for your support, and I do hope to continue putting out content that hopefully you would like to continue to support as well. So thank you very much. And if none of this sounds like something that you would be interested in, you can, of course, always just like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. That really does help out quite a bit. So thank you everyone for watching, and I suppose let's get into the deck tech and continue on. So first up, we got to talk about our random card for this week. And in this case, it is a suggested card by Bring to MF Ruckus on Reddit. And it's a bit of an interesting card, and it is a legendary creature. In this case, it is Ashling the Pilgrim. And Ashling the Pilgrim is one and a red for a legendary creature, Elemental Shaman. It's a 1-1. One, one. You can pay one and a red and put a plus one, plus one counter on Ashling the Pilgrim. And if this is the third time this ability has resolved this turn, remove all plus one, plus one counters from Ashling the Pilgrim, and it deals that much damage to each creature and each player. So we can continuously put plus one, plus one counters on Ashling, and as long as we don't trigger it three times in one turn, we get to keep those counters and it never deals the damage. However, if we do want to do a ton of damage, maybe wipe the board, do some damage to our opponents, we can trigger this three times in one turn and kind of just do exactly that, do a ton of damage to both our opponents and our opponent's creatures. Notably, though, it will also do that damage to us and to our creatures, so we got to make sure that we can somehow benefit from that. And as you may be able to guess, since our random card of the week is Ashling the Pilgrim, that means that our commander for this week is also... Ashling the Pilgrim. So without any further ado, let's take a look at the deck itself and start by talking about some themes for this deck and what we're really aiming to do. So the first theme that we have with this is going to be cards that care about non-combat damage. Since Ashling can do non-combat damage to every single creature and every single player, it's important that we have ways to benefit from that. There's no point in just wiping the board if we don't actually do something with it. So, to that end, we have something like Soulscar Mage, which is one red for a 1-2 human wizard with prowess. If a source you control would deal non-combat damage to a creature an opponent controls, put that many minus one minus one counters on that creature instead. So this is a great card with Ashling because Ashling is going to do, at a bare minimum, about 3 damage to each creature and each opponent. Well, and ourselves too, of course. 
But doing 3 damage to each creature with Soul Scar Mage in play means that that 3 damage actually winds up being in the form of minus 1, minus 1 counters. So even if a creature is big enough to survive, it's now a lot smaller. And so we can kind of trigger this multiple times, hopefully getting Ashling into play maybe multiple times, and then just killing the board with these minus 1, minus 1 counters. And we can even keep Soul Scar Mage alive thanks to Prowess if that's something that we're interested in doing. We can cast non-creature spells, give it plus one, plus one, wipe the board away with Ashling, and then all of a sudden, we still have Soul Scar Mage, our opponent's stuff's a lot cheaper, we can do it again later. So Soul Scar Mage is a phenomenal example of what we're really trying to do with non-combat damage, and is a phenomenal payoff for that as well. So leading into our next theme then... We have something a little bit different, and that is giving Ashling keywords. We want to make sure that when we do that much damage to everything, we are benefiting from it in some way. And the specific wording on Ashling the Pilgrim is that Ashling does the damage. So if we put a Basilisk Collar on Ashling, Ashling now has Death Touch and Lifelink. Death Touch means that no matter how much damage we do, it's going to kill every single creature on the board. That's just a hard board wipe. And Life Link means we are gaining that much life. So if there are five creatures on the board and we do three damage to each of them, we just gained 15 life, not counting the additional 12 life that's coming from our opponents. So we can gain a ton of life very, very quickly and also make sure that we're absolutely clearing the board away every single time we activate Ashling for the third time in a turn. And this might not be super efficient, but it is a way to make sure that our game plan runs smoothly because there's nothing that's going to survive this. Well, unless it has Indestructible, of course. And we're going to gain enough life that we can survive long enough to redeploy Ashling. So absolutely perfect card for this deck. And there's a ton of cards that do very similar things. Basilisk Collar being one of the best because it does Death Touch and Lifelink. Most of them just do one or the other. But really, either one is perfect for what we're trying to do. And then our last theme for this deck is going to revolve around mana. We need to make sure that we make as much mana as we possibly can. Ashling needs to be activated three times in one turn just to be able to do her thing. And that takes a total of six mana. Six mana is not easy to come by, especially when... Most of the time, we don't want Ashling to be sitting around in play waiting to get killed before we can actually activate her. So we need to make sure that we make a ton of mana in one turn, cast Ashling, trigger her three times, and just wipe the board away. And so to that end, we have something like Rousing Refrain, which is three red red for a sorcery. Add red for each card in target opponent's hand. And until end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. Exile Rousing Refrain with three time counters on it. And then it has, of course, Suspend 3 for 1 and a red. So we could, in theory, on turn 2, play Rousing Refrain, or I guess more accurately, we could Suspend Rousing Refrain. It would come down three turns later, give us all that red mana, and re-suspend itself so we could do it again later. That allows us to kind of save our mana for the turn we know we want to do whatever we want to do, make a ton of mana with Rousing Refrain, have a bunch of mana with our lands, maybe have some other ways to generate mana, some other cards like Mana Geyser and things like that. So Rousing Refrain, awesome card, but really it's a great example of what we're trying to do to get the mana to really go off with Ashling. So those are our themes of the deck, and our next piece of this deck tech is to take a look at some key cards, some cards that synergize super well with what we're doing, and really... If we could have them in play for all of our games, there's a good chance that this deck becomes pretty hard to beat. So first up, we have Scythe of the Wretched, which is two mana for an equipment artifact. Equipped creature gets plus two plus two. Whenever a creature dealt damage by equipped creature this turn is put into a graveyard, return that card to play under your control. Attach Scythe of the Wretched to that creature. Equip four. So... If we activate Ashling and we get her to trigger three times, we wipe the board away of all creatures. If we've equipped Ashling with Scythe of the Wretched, every single creature that dies now gets put into play under our control. 
and we can kind of stack the triggers for scythe to make sure that the creature we want to have the scythe is the one that winds up equipped to it in the end but essentially this is just kind of a permanent insurrection style effect with ashling we just steal every other creature on board and put it into play under our control and it's really hard to lose the game at that point because our opponents no longer have boards and we just took all of their best stuff so we're getting all of the enter the battlefield effects we're getting all of the attack triggers we're able to swing with these creatures i mean provided of course our opponents don't wipe the board in return and it would be ideal if we picked up something that say gave all of our creatures haste but that might be a little bit too much of a pipe dream either way though scythe of the wretched is absolutely phenomenal in this deck and really kind of is our biggest payoff for what we're trying to do with Ashling. So next up, though, we do have a bit of a different card, although still works super well with what we're doing. That is going to be Tectonic Reformation. And Tectonic Reformation is one and a red for an enchantment. Each land card in your hand has cycling for a red, and this enchantment itself has cycling for two. And this doesn't look super powerful right off the bat and it really doesn't synergize too much with what we're doing but you've got to keep in mind that because ashling wants us to have so much mana we are running an above average number of lands in this deck we're actually running 40 total lands in our mono red deck that means that there will be times when we kind of flood out a little bit we've got too many lands in our hand there's not much we can do about that so if we have tectonic reformation we never have another dead card in our hand. Anytime we draw a land and we don't want it, we can just pay one red mana, throw it away, and draw a new card. And if we happen to draw another land, we can just repeat this process. So Tectonic Reformation really helps us smooth out some of our draws and helps us get to where we want to be because there are going to be times when we draw too many lands. But that's kind of the downside we have to survive because we need the lands to do what Ashling wants to do. We needed to make sure that we had an above average number so we can really go off if we need to. And I think to that end, that's why Tectonic Reformation is a key card because honestly, it just helps this deck run really, really well. So a phenomenal card, and I'm very happy that we were able to get it into this deck. And finally, we have our last card in the key cards section and that is tyrite sanctum now tyrite sanctum is a little weird and you might be wondering why specifically there's a land here but the main reason it's here is because in mono red it is incredibly difficult to find ways to make creatures indestructible tyrite sanctum makes a creature indestructible yeah there's a lot of hoops that we have to go through to get there but it is going to be worth it in the end because Tyrite Sanctum, obviously a land, taps for a colorless mana. You can pay two, tap it, target legendary creature. It's going to be Ashling. Becomes a god in addition to its other types. Put a plus one, plus one counter on it. All, already perfect. We want to have those plus one, plus one counters. So great. But the real payoff is that you can pay for, tap, sacrifice Tyrite Sanctum, put an indestructible counter on target god. Now that Ashling is a god with its first ability, we've now made Ashling indestructible. Ashling, unfortunately, when it does its damage to everything, also hits itself. So being able to make Ashling indestructible with Tyrite Sanctum is actually incredibly powerful because we can just wipe the board away of all creatures and keep Ashling on the board so that we can keep threatening to do it again in the future. And as long as we have six mana and an indestructible counter on Ashling, our opponents really can't have any creatures from there on out, especially if we have something like Basilisk Collar or especially if we have Scythe of the Wretched and we just threaten to steal whatever they play and still keep our commander so tyrite sanctum does not look like much on the surface but i promise you it's one of the only ways in mono red at least one of the only budget ways in mono red to give a creature indestructible so it's really earned its place in this deck and i'm very happy to see it pretty much any time i ever drew it playing this deck so those are our key cards for this week and the next step of course is to take a look at some cool interactions some cards that work very well together and really just kind of help synergize and move the deck along hopefully to a winning end so the first of these cool interactions is going to be soul bright flamekin and heartstone 
So Soul Bright Flamekin, one in a red for a creature elemental shaman. It's a 2-1, and you can pay 2, and target creature gains trample until end of turn. And if this is the third time this ability has resolved this turn, you may add 8 red mana to your mana pool. So the main idea here is that you pay 6 mana into this, and then you get 8 mana back. So it's kind of a mini ritual. It's still a lot of mana, but it gets you more in the end. But if we partner that up with Heartstone which is a three mana artifact that says the cost of each creature's ability requiring an activation cost is reduced by one. This cannot reduce an ability's generic mana cost to less than one. But that means that Soul Bright Flamekin's ability now costs one mana. We can spend three mana to give target creature trample three times and then get eight mana back. And we could, in theory, do this every single turn. So if we have anything that needs mana or a mana sink in play, we can just kind of keep pumping mana into it. Now, ideally, that means that we could put a ton of counters on Ashling every single turn. Because if we're just putting two counters on Ashling every turn, then it doesn't trigger the board wipe ability. And then in the end, the board wipe is going to be even bigger. So Soul Bright Flamekin, Heartstone, Awesome cards, very great on their own, especially because Heartstone also reduces the cost of Ashling's ability to one mana instead of two. But when combined, they really allow us to get a lot farther on board than probably anyone expected, hopefully anyone expected, and be able to kind of pull ahead and do the things that we're hoping to do with our deck. So that is cool interaction number one. And of course, that leads us into cool interaction number two, which is going to be between Heat Shimmer and Dual Caster Mage. Now, I'm pretty confident that I've talked about these two cards in a cool interaction segment on this channel before, but I feel it's always relevant to bring these two up because I put them in almost every red deck I play at this point because this is a two-mana win-the-game combination. And yeah, Ashling is great, and I want to win using our main game plan, but I do think it's always important to have a backup just in case something goes wrong. So the way that this works is we have Heat Shimmer, two and a red for a sorcery, create a token that's a copy of target creature, except it has haste, and at the beginning of the end step, exile this permanent. So we cast that targeting any creature we have, it doesn't even have to be ours, really. It could be one of our opponent's creatures. Then we cast Dual Caster Mage, which is one red red for a human wizard, 2-2, two, two, flash. When Dual Caster Mage enters the battlefield, copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So Dual Caster Mage enters play, copies Heat Shimmer, and changes the target of Heat Shimmer to the Dual Caster Mage. Then the copy of Heat Shimmer resolves. We make another Dual Caster Mage. The Dual Caster Mage copy resolves. Seeing the original Heat Shimmer still on the stack, makes a copy of it, makes another Dual Caster Mage, makes another Heat Shimmer, and the cycle continues until we decide to end it by choosing any other creature. And we have an infinite amount of Dual Caster Mages, all with haste. And at that point, unless our opponents have some way to stop us from attacking or some way to prevent the combat damage, we just win the game on the spot because no one can stop an infinite number of tutus unless they're pretty prepared for it. So yeah, this isn't our main game plan and it wouldn't be the best win, but it's still a win and it's something that is still relevant to point out because it is just a backup just in case something goes wrong with our main game plan. So that's the nice thing about Heat Shimmer and Dual Caster Mage is they can kind of go into any mono red deck. And honestly, they're great on their own. Dual Caster Mage could sometimes ramp us. It could help us counter something. And Heat Shimmer just gives us another copy of something that's really powerful. So phenomenal cards on their own, but a win-the-game combination combined. So those are our cool interactions for the week. And finally, the last piece of this is to take a look at the actual budget of the deck. And this week... We came very, very close to our budget limit. We wound up at $99.16. So we are super close to that $100 limit. And a lot of it comes from multiple cards. But 
The main one that we're going to focus on, obviously the most expensive card in this deck, is going to be the Sword of Cauldra, which is four mana for a legendary artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus five plus five. Whenever equipped creature deals damage to a creature, remove that creature from the game and then equip four. So what this does is we are able to equip this to Ashling. And then whenever we board wipe with Ashling, not only do we destroy every creature that's in play, we exile every creature that's in play. And that can be backbreaking for some decks, especially decks that are aiming to rely on death triggers, decks that are aiming on using their graveyard, decks that really just want their creatures around in general. So Sword of Cauldra, yes, is very expensive, $16.14. But for the ability to exile almost everything on the board in Mono Red, it's hard to say no to because that's not something that Mono Red really gets to do. With that being said, though, if you are looking to trim the price of the deck, get it down below $90. I mean, with this card, you'd get it down below almost to $80 then Sword of Cauldra is a good card to cut. There are other ramp spells you can include. There's other burn spells, other creatures. So this is not a card that is necessary for this deck at all, but it is very powerful and it does have a unique effect for what we're trying to do. On the other hand, maybe you're looking to increase the price of this deck and you're looking for some out-of-budget upgrades. And just like we did last week, we're going to talk a little bit about what card I might put into this deck if I had the budget to do so, and what card I would replace if you were looking to make a one-to-one -one swap, because I do know some people are interested in putting these decks together to try them out for themselves. So, the first card that would be an out-of-budget upgrade is Braid of Fire, and Braid of Fire is one and a red for an enchantment, cumulative upkeep, add a red to your mana pool, and that's it, that's all it does. And I would replace a Dark Steel Ingot with this, which is three mana for an artifact. It's indestructible, and it taps to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Now, the reason that I would choose Dark Steel Ingot is because they're both actually mana sources. It doesn't look like it on the front, because Braid of Fire doesn't actually do anything. It just has a cumulative upkeep. But the nice thing about Braid of Fire is that it was designed during a time when mana burn existed, where you would lose life for not spending your mana. So that cumulative upkeep was actually a downside if you got too much mana. In Modern Magic, that's not the case. We can add as much red mana as we want, and it's never going to become a bad thing for us. So by putting in Braid of Fire, we have enough instants, especially with Ashling being able to activate our commander, that having that mana in our upkeep is not a terrible idea. So I would suggest swapping out Braid of Fire for Dark Steel Ingot because Braid of Fire is going to give us that mana every turn and also increase how much mana we're actually getting. Dark Steel Ingot, while great, it is an indestructible mana rock. The main draw of it is that it's indestructible and adds a mana of any color. We don't need a mana of any color, we just need red, since we're mono red, and I would rather get multiple uses out of Braid of Fire and the multiple mana it provides than the single one from Dark Steel Ingot once a turn. So, obviously Dark Steel Ingot is still a great card and does deserve to be in this deck, however, if you're looking to upgrade, I would recommend Braid of Fire. Now, Braid of Fire is not the only out-of-budget upgrade I would recommend. I do actually have two more suggestions for you. And the next one is one that I mentioned a little bit earlier, and that is going to be Dark Steel Plate. It is very difficult in Mono Red to find ways to give indestructible to your creatures. So Dark Steel Plate, being three mana for an artifact equipment, it itself has indestructible, and it gives equipped creature indestructible and has equipped two means that this is a very hard card to come by. We would love to have this in our deck if we could, but it is sitting at $15.41, so it is pretty expensive. Now, if you were looking to replace an actual card, because maybe you have a Dark Steel Plate, or you don't mind spending the $15, personally, I would choose to replace Gorgon Flail. Gorgon Flail is 2 mana for an artifact equipment. Equipped creature gets plus 1, plus 1, and has Death Touch. Equip 2. Obviously, these two are not equivalent. They do not do the exact same thing. However, we have a ton of ways in this deck to give Death Touch to our creatures. 
So losing one way to give death touch is definitely worth it to get one way to give indestructible. We have plenty of death touch options, but we don't have plenty of indestructible options. So I would say it's very much worth it, especially because if we can make uh, Ashling indestructible, then that's going to be worth a lot more in the long run than death touch because we can get her nice and big. There's nothing that can kill her. And then we can wipe the board and she's still sitting around and doing what we want her to do. So dark steel plate, an absolutely amazing card for this deck, really what we want to do, but it is very unfortunate that it's almost $16. And we do have one more out-of-budget upgrade. This one is a bit unique, and it's a bit of an older card, but the out-of-budget upgrade that I would suggest for our final one this week is Repercussion. And Repercussion is one red-red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature is dealt damage, Repercussion deals that much damage to that creature's controller. And this is unfortunately a reserve list card. It's sitting close to $30, currently $27.18. But what it does with Ashling is incredibly powerful. Because if our opponent has even just one creature, we activate Ashling three times, we do three damage to each player and each creature. So our opponent takes three damage, their creature takes three damage, and then Repercussion sees their creature take three damage, so our opponent takes another three damage. So in the end, we would wipe away our opponent's one creature and do six damage to their face. Now, yes, this is symmetrical, so it's going to hit us as well, and that is why I would replace one of the creatures in the deck, because if you're running Repercussion, you probably want to run just a little bit less creatures. You don't want to shoot yourself in the face for a ton of damage. So I would recommend taking out Chandra's Pyreling, which is one in a red for a 1-3 Elemental Lizard. Whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, Chandra's Pyreling gets plus 1 plus 0 and gains double strike until end of turn. Now, the Pyreling is obviously a very powerful card, and it does do a lot of good work in this deck. However, it is on the weaker side in terms of toughness, so if we're looking to do a ton of damage with Ashling, it's not going to survive most of the Ashling triggers. In fact, it won't survive any of them unless we put something on it, make it a little bit bigger, maybe an equipment or something. So, Chandra's Pyreling is great, but if we're really running our main game plan and we have a repercussion then Chandra's Pyreling just really doesn't quite cut it. So I would recommend if you do add Repercussion to at least take out the Pyreling or take out some creature, because obviously the less creatures we have, the less damage we're going to take with Repercussion. But it is a phenomenal card if you don't mind spending the $27 to get it, because sometimes with Ashling, if your opponent just has a board full of creatures, this just wins you the game. You do three damage to each creature, each of them does three damage to your opponent, and they just die so repercussion is absolutely great in ashling and like i said if you don't mind spending for it then hey it would be a great include but that brings us to the official end of our deck tech the last piece that we've got to deal with with this deck is seeing how it runs in a game because we can talk about this deck all day long but really we want to see how it plays so this week we are playing against three opponents we have Bilal. Jason, and Sean, and Bilal is playing his Atraxa Praetor's Voice deck, Jason playing his Elegeth Crossroads Augur and Kaidel Chosen of Crufix Partners deck, and Sean playing Greasefang Okiba Boss. So Bilal's Atraxa deck is a Super Friends deck, so he wants to play a ton of Planeswalkers and then use Atraxa to both protect his Planeswalkers and also proliferate, being able to increase their loyalty every single end step. So I will say with our deck, I am a little worried about Atraxa because Ashling does damage to each creature and each player, but it specifically does not hit Planeswalkers. And that can be a bit of a problem because we got to make sure that we don't just wipe the board full of creatures and then have Bilal drop a ton of Planeswalkers that we can't deal with. So I am very worried about Atraxa. I do think that's the one that I'm most worried about this week. So hopefully... We can apply enough pressure to keep the walkers off the board. And, well, honestly, I would love to not have to deal with them at all. So we'll see how that one goes. 
And then next up, we have Jason's Kaidel Chosen of Crufix and Elegeth Crossroads Augur deck. Kaidel allows Jason to make mana for each card that he's drawn this turn, and then Elegeth allows him to replace his scry triggers with draw triggers. So his deck is full of creatures that want to scry, creatures that tap and untap, so he can make a ton of mana, draw a ton of cards, and kind of just slowly value out his opponents, because if he's got 15 cards in hand and 15 mana every turn, then, you know, what are we going to do? So I'm hoping that um, Ashling's going to be able to keep Elegith and Kaidel in check. And as long as we can do six damage every time we activate Ashling, that would kill Elegith. That would definitely kill Kaidel. And I'm hoping that's enough to set Jason back enough that we can kind of just slowly burn him out and win the game. And then finally, we have Sean and his Grease Fang Okiba boss deck. Once again, I mentioned this last week, and if you haven't seen last week's video, please do check it out. But last week he played his Grease Fang deck, and I absolutely love vehicle strategies, so I am very happy to see Grease Fang sitting down. Um, I personally have a Dapala deck that's all about vehicles. I know Bilal has a Shorikai deck that's all about vehicles. So it's nice to see that we now have Orzov, Azorius, and boros represented and grease fang all about wanting to reanimate vehicles so he wants to put things like parhelion 2 into the graveyard reanimate them with grease fang and start swinging with vehicles a lot sooner than he should and i'm a big fan of this style of strategy and a little bit of a brag myself i actually just played grease fang and pioneer last week and went undefeated so if you are interested in seeing that deck i've done some pioneer deck techs before i would be happy to do one again so let me know if that is something you would be interested in but these are our opponents for the week, and I'm very excited to see how this game goes because I love all of these commanders, and I'm super, super interested to see how we fare. So I hope you all enjoy the video. I'm sure I will enjoy playing it, and I will talk to you all once it is done. At the start of the game, Bilal goes first, followed by Jason, Sean, and then myself. On Bilal's first turn, he plays a Misty Rainforest, sacrificing it to search his library for his Zagoth Triome and put it into play. Jason plays a Hinterland Harbor. Sean plays a Swamp, casts Okiba Reckoner Raid, doing one damage to each opponent while he gains one life. I play a Mountain. Bilal plays a Polluted Delta, sacrificing it to search his library for an Indatha Triome, putting it into play. Jason plays a Rejuvenating Spring and then casts Omen Speaker, scrying two when it enters. Sean plays a Plains and casts Sram Senior Edificer, allowing him to draw a card whenever he casts an aura, equipment, or a vehicle. And we also remember at this point that his Saga triggers again, making each opponent lose a life while Sean gains a life. I play a Mountain and cast a Star Compass and pass. Bilal plays a Tapped Breeding Pool. Jason plays an Island and then attacks me for one, and in his second main phase, he casts Seeker of Skybreak, which can tap to untap target creature. Sean plays a Mech Hanger and also transforms his Saga into a 2-2 creature that gives all his vehicles menace. He then casts Entomb, searching his library for a card and putting it into his graveyard, choosing Parhelion 2. He then casts a Gearshift Ace, which gives a vehicle first strike when used to crew, and attacks me for two with Sram. On my turn, I play a Mountain and cast my commander, Ashling the Pilgrim. Bilal plays a Hinterland Harbor and casts his commander, Atraxa Praetor's Voice, allowing him to proliferate at the end of his turn. Jason plays a Castle Vantress and casts his commander, Kaidel, Chosen of Crufix, which can tap for mana equal to the number of cards he's drawn this turn. Sean plays a Swamp and casts his commander, Greasefang Okiba Boss. He then moves to combat, returning Parhelion 2 to play with Greasefang's ability and immediately crewing it with Greasefang. This allows him to attack Bilal for 7, creating two 4-4 angel tokens, one of which is attacking Jason, while the other, plus the Gearshift Ace, attack me for 6. Then, Parhelion returns to his hand, and at the end of turn, I activate my commander to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. I play a Mountain, and then cast Basilisk Collar 
and I equip the collar to Ashling, giving it Death Touch and Lifelink. Bilal plays a Plains and casts Coalition Relic before moving to combat, attacking Jason for 4, gaining 4 life, and he then activates Coalition Relic, putting a counter on it and proliferating it at the end of his turn. Jason casts his other commander, Elegith Crossroads Augur, allowing him to draw cards instead of scrying, and then plays an island and passes. Sean plays a Maze of Ith, and then attacks Bilal for 2 with Menace, Jason for 8 with his Angels, and me for 4 with Greasefang. Jason blocks one of the Angels with Elegith, and Sean uses his Maze of Ith to return the Angel out of combat, saving it. Then, Bilal takes 2 damage, while Jason and I both take 4. Then, at the end of turn, I activate my Commander Ashling, putting another counter on it. On my turn, I play a Mountain, and pass. Bilal, in his pre-combat main phase, removes 2 counters from Coalition Relic, making 2 blue mana. This allows him to cast Emergent Ultimatum, searching his library for three monocolored cards. Then, an opponent chooses one of them to put back into his library while he casts the other two for free. This has him revealing Liliana, Dreadhorde General, Doubling Season, which was originally going to be Vorinclex Monstrous Raider, but he correctly realized that I could kill Vorinclex with Ashling, ruining his combo, and Omniscience. After much deliberation, the table decides to give him Omniscience and Liliana, realizing that doubling season kills us with most of his planeswalkers and hoping that what's in his hand isn't enough to win him the game immediately. Once the Omniscience resolves, he's able to cast spells from his hand without paying their mana cost, allowing him to empty his hand, playing out Vraska, Relic Seeker, Tamio, the Moon Sage, Sorin, Solemn Visitor, and Sorin, Lord of Innistrad. He then activates Solemn Visitor's plus 1 ability to give his creatures plus 1, plus 0, and lifelink until end of turn, activates Liliana's plus 1 ability to create a 2-2 zombie token, and then moves to combat, attacking me for 5 with Atraxa, gaining 5 life. Then, in his second main phase, he activates Frasca's minus 3 ability to destroy Ashling and make a treasure token. Unfortunately, I have to choose not to trigger her ability three times, killing all creatures and gaining 119 life, so that hopefully someone else's creatures can start chipping away at Bilal's planeswalkers. Bilal also activates Lord of Innistrad's plus one ability, making a 1-1 vampire token, and activates Tamio's minus two ability to draw two cards since Sean has two tapped creatures. After that, he's able to cast Garrick Apex Predator, and activate Garrick's minus 3 ability to destroy Sean's Nizumi Road Captain and gain 2 life. However, in response, Sean casts a costly plunder, sacrificing the captain to draw 2 cards. Then, at the end of Bilal's turn, Atraxa proliferates all of Bilal's planeswalkers. On Jason's turn, he activates Castle Vantress, drawing 2 thanks to Elegith, and he then plays a Command Tower and casts a Kodama's Reach, searching his library for two basic lands, putting one into play tapped and the other to his hand. After that, he attacks Liliana for five, putting her down to only three loyalty. Sean plays a Swamp and also attacks Liliana, this time for eight, Vraska for four, and Tamio for two. Bilal blocks the attackers going at Vraska and Tamio, killing both blockers and drawing two cards, then he lets Liliana die. In Sean's second main phase, he casts Morbid Curiosity, sacrificing Greasefang to draw three cards, then, at the end of turn, I cycle a Tectonic Reformation. On my turn, I play a Mountain, I cast Rousing Refrain, making seven red mana since Sean has seven cards in his hand, and then suspending the Refrain with three time counters on it. After that, I cast a Roiling Vortex, doing 5 damage to any player that casts a spell without spending mana, but unfortunately, Bilal counters it with Swan Song, making me a 2 2 bird token. Once that's resolved, I cast a Gratuitous Violence, doubling the damage my creatures do, and I also cast a Chandra's Pyreling. On Bilal's turn, he casts Mirari's Wake, letting his lands tap for double the mana and giving his creatures plus one plus one, casts a Sylvan Caryatid, 
then plays a Windswept Heath and activates Tamiyo's minus two ability to draw three cards since Jason has three tapped creatures. This allows him to cast Kaya Ghost Assassin and immediately activate Kaya's minus two ability, making each opponent discard a card while Bilal draws a card. After that, he casts an Eternal Witness, returning Liliana Dreadhorde General to his hand, and then casts Vraska Golgari Queen and recasts Liliana Dreadhorde General. He activates Golgari Queen's plus two ability, sacrificing Eternal Witness to draw two cards and gain a life, and then casts Karth the Lion, and at this point, we all know there's no way out, and Bilal even mentions he's going to continue drawing cards and casting Planeswalkers, so we all decide to concede, winning Bilal the game. Alright, so that was a sweet game. I was definitely right in my prediction that Bilal having Planeswalkers was really going to mess with us because Ashling couldn't deal with them. And it was super unfortunate that the turn that Bilal really went off with his walkers, we had the ability to gain 119 life since Ashling had lifelink. But... I wasn't actually able to do it because I didn't want to wipe away all the creatures and then leave the Planeswalkers. My hope was that Elegeth and Greasefang and the rest of Sean and Jason's boards would be enough to really take down the walkers, but not quite what we were able to do. And I will say there was a lot of debate when Bilal cast that Emergent Ultimatum and Jason, Sean, and I had to decide which card to put back. Uh, I do think in the end the doubling season was still the right call because I think doubling season immediately kills us all with Liliana and then doubling season plus omniscience just kills us in general because of how many planeswalkers he has and we were really banking on him not having that many walkers in his hand so when he dropped five onto the battlefield we were <laughs> a little concerned. And it's no surprise that the game ended right after that. But I do think, other than that, everyone else's deck showed off some really powerful things. Like I said, we could have gained 119 life. We could have wiped away the board. I think Ashling is a super cool commander, and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Um, I'd love to see this deck get a second chance at some point, but didn't quite go in our favor this week. And then... Grease Fang, also very powerful. Sean was able to drop Grease Fang and immediately reanimate a Parhelion and start smacking people with angels and a giant 5-5 with first strike, which was super sweet to see. And it's just a shame that he wasn't able to get more angels before the Planeswalkers dropped so that he could kill them. And then, of course, Jason's Elegeth and Kaidel deck. He didn't quite draw as many cards as I think he wanted to. It didn't help that when he got Elegeth on board, all of the Planeswalkers started to come out. So definitely very powerful and i think that if he were given just one maybe two more turns i think jason probably would have had this game because i don't think any of us could have kept up with him so super sweet showing by all the decks this week and i'm very happy with the game and i hope you are as well as always if you liked the video please do actually like the video and then subscribe to our youtube channel that does help out quite a bit and as always if you have any suggestions for future videos if you would like to see deck techs like i mentioned earlier that pioneer deck tech i would be happy to do that if you are interested in suggesting cards for this series i'm more than happy to do that i do have quite a few in the works so i do apologize if you suggest a card and it takes a while to get there i'm working on it i promise there's just a lot in the in the queue shall we say so thank you everybody for watching i hope you enjoyed it and i will see you all on the other side of the dungeon learner's guide